All right, your time starts now. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everybody, or to give it the correct flavor, hey, y'all, uh, <laughs> which would be very much what I would hear from my volunteers. Um, so if you can en endure my uh, complicated accent, I hope we can all communicate at some level today. Um, what I'm here to talk about really is how the community heritage effort across two countries, across the Atlantic, um, became united in a program that I'm involved with, and then from that node has begun to move out into other community documentation efforts in our area of the South. But I'd like to say a few words about how this adventure began for me and then eventually as leader of this group. Um, I started teaching simple field mapping techniques for, you see, there we go, yes, um, including plane table use. Uh, this is actually from uh, a trip we took to Scotland with students, one of my students, Samantha Beckinger, they're working the plane table. Um, because it was a good way to integrate a number of things that my students were falling down on severely. One was the simplest of mathematics, addition, subtraction, uh, the idea that triangles exist. It's a novel idea. Uh, <laughs> and how to do this graphically so that they didn't have to do complicated numerical solutions that would simply leave them lost. And the plane table was one method of doing this because of the, the deeply graphic nature of it. Um, now, this was informed by two uh, authors, two geographic authors from the 20th century in particular. I like to call them my friends Frank and Dave. Uh, <laughs> uh, Frank Debenham, who you may have heard of, a very famous geographer who traveled with Scott um, to the Antarctic in 1912, obviously returned, so he wasn't with Scott on the travel part of the expedition. Uh, he did some of the primary plane table work on the coast of Antarctica with a plane table made out of a breadboard, um, a photographic plane table, and an alidade made out of a ruler and a pair of uh, cast off brass hinges. Um, when he came back from all of these experiences, he became a professor at Cambridge, taught geography there for many years. Um, and the other is David Greenhood, who wrote a splendid book um, trying to popularize maps and mapping. And what they had in common uh, was something that really reached out to me with my goals for instruction and for work in the community. Um, and that is that common people ought to make maps for themselves, for their own purposes, and to better know their own world. And so the taking off point for me was exactly that. Now, um, we'll see a couple of examples here of work that came out of that period of uh, working with students. This is, as you can see, Bailey's Chapel Cemetery, um, a black cemetery in Lauderdale County. Uh, we were requested by the trustees of this cemetery to come uh, and make a map so they knew where they could sell plots. Um, it's a very important map for me because if you look uh, for you to the right over here, you'll see that the graves are very randomly organized. They're not particularly in rows. Their um, orientation, their azimuth, is not consistent. What they are consistent with is a black American burial pattern that persists up into about 1900. And so you can see the horizon of a culturization, a culturalization as you come across the cemetery from one side to the other. Here, very orderly, Right, azimuth alignment, very, very consistent. Back to the oldest graves, probably family or kinship groups, and very, very random work. This, is, this was one of the maps that began to indicate to me that there were bigger things to be done um, in our county. Um, this is another map, doesn't show as well, made by one of my students, um, of a memorial wall uh, memorializing the experience of Native Americans in our area. They were exiled by military force at the end of the 1830s, um, and some of them returned, including the ancestors of the man that built this wall. 
Uh, to give you an idea, the total complex, if you add all the length of the parallel walls, is about a kilometer of rubble and face wall from about waist to mid-chest high um, up to two or even three meters wide. So it's an incredible undertaking, a uh, very important cultural landmark in our area. But here is the place that kicked off the effort that we're really here to talk about today. Um, in 2011, Walmart, or as I've been informed, it's called ASTA here in, uh, <laughs> anyway, the great Satan, uh, <laughs> decided, decided that uh, we were not served by one massive store enough in our city of 35,000. We had to have another massive store. And this would go on a footprint that our city planners had decided was for community development. And since there was nothing to prevent retail going in there, they plopped it down. They were going to plop it down. Um, this made a number of people upset. People in that suburban neighborhood did not want a massive shopping center uh, in their backyard. And there were two historic cemeteries there. It was laid over the core of the John Coffey Cemetery, uh, plantation rather, a uh, plantation called Hickory Hill. John Coffey was an intimate friend of Andrew Jackson. Um, Coffey was one of the founders of our city. Um, in fact, the first person to lay out our city. He was a surveyor, among other things. Um, and uh, a founder of our state. The Walmart property line was going to run right here and does run right here. Um, presently, that's where the parking lot begins. So the question was, are these uh, cemetery sites going to be compromised? This pretty simple five-foot brick wall put up in the 1920s surrounding it, maybe. Are there burials here? Are there burials in other places? What's the original layout? Um, and over here, if you look at a large-scale map, as we've been able to show, about 130 um, graves of black originally slaves and then their descendants. All this might have been compromised. I was swept up into the controversy and the documentation of this. Again, the, this map is part of that effort uh, to show, yes, there are people buried there. Believe it or not, the landowner uh, claimed that there were no burials. Again, remember five foot brick wall, three quarters of a meter thick huge monuments, uh, and then 130 very clear grave depressions uh, further off in the forest. So um, that's still, by the way, in, in progress. But this um, galvanized a remarkable gentleman named Billy Joe Sledge. Um, he's almost, at his prime, he was almost a caricature who had drunk and fought um, and um, his way across the county as a young man uh, and done all kinds of labor and then eventually conceived a passion for local heritage and cemeteries. Um, a remarkable mind because he had them memorized. 430 some memorized across the county. So he became a crucial link in what went forward. Because there was a city crisis, this was in the city limits, he went to the county commission and said, there are cemeteries in the county that will be threatened. Something needs to be done. You need to set up an organization. So with an eye for a grandiose title, sorry, we couldn't get Royal Commission in the United States. Uh, <laughs> um, he came up with the name of the Lauderdale County Cemetery Rehabilitation Authority. Much long, too long for anybody to pronounce. Um, so the LCCRA. Um, now, he also was very smart in a lot of ways ways beyond the memorization and knowing of cemeteries and genealogy. And that was that he could bring together these very, very quirky people in our county who were interested in cemeteries, but he couldn't hold them together. They, they would not have a direction to go. They would not have a technical point of completion that they might proceed to. Um, and he and I had gotten to know each other through the Walmart fight. Um, which include one remarkable moment when the archaeologists who were claiming that there was nothing to worry about, just trust us, we're professional. Um, it reached a point they were going to be doing scraping. 
And so we said, well, uh, I think that we need a couple of citizen observers for this. And they said, oh no, no archaeologists ever let people come on their sites. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I just spent a week in Scotland, you know, <laughs> digging outside of Port Mahomac, and um, nobody seemed to object it that I and 10 other so volunteers were there doing it. And so, no, we're not going to take that as an answer. Um, and my outburst on that level got the respect of Billy Joe. So <laughs> uh, I showed up at a meeting of the LCCRA, and lo and behold, I had been volunteered as the chair. <laughs> so when I'm using the first person pronoun, I'm not trying to make myself large. It's simply a result of, um, again, be, being raised to something I wasn't quite sure I wanted to be in charge of anyway. And so the question was, what do I do next? Um, everybody was looking to me, and I had to come up with some sort of pattern. And the result was, come to Scotland. Um, because when I was searching for information on plane table mapping, early Google, um, all of a sudden, Scotland's Rural Pass popped up. And there were people running plane tables, as I had been doing with my students for about 10 years at that point. And I thought, I am home. I have found my people, so to speak. Uh, people who go out in bad weather with plane tables, right? And, and map things. And, and it was a great, great point. Um, then I fought my way through the apparently necessarily opaque um, websites that are set up for institutions in, we talked about this yesterday, in the UK, and finally came up with a name, Tricia Barnett, who politely told me that, well, her contract was up, so sorry. Um, and then finally found Eve. Eve dug through emails, found an email from me, and sent one back saying, I think you've been asking about what we do. I said, well, yes, I have. Uh, and I was able to wangle some money out of our university um, and come to Scotland first in 2013. Now, this was after the active phase of Scotland's rural past. But Eve sat me down with um, things I would not have thought to look at. Um, the debate over medieval and later rural settlements. Um, the idea of whether there should be a uh, national effort to look into them. The market, if you dare call it that, research, um, the resource research that was done before Scotland's Rural Pass ever started to act. And so I came back to uh, Alabama with that, but also continued the connections in Scotland. So here, um, Roland, you're in here. Uh, and this is our group that came, part of our group that came in 2015. Um, on the moor at Brechlet Hadi, having lunch. Falls of the Dochert, because this is in Glen Dochert. And then, of course, plane tabling, um, looking out across the valley. And the result of that, with, Le with Eve's uh, extraordinarily patient guidance, um, was a field sheet um, that she tiled together. I think we had four uh, plane tables working, so it was some job to put this thing together. Um, but she was able to do it, so uh, the students did this. Now, uh, this impressed me, and so I began to take the idea that we could bring Scottish models of organization and work to Alabama. These are two of our volunteers, Lee Freeman, local history librarian, and um, as you'll see, uh, in this case, Laura Campbell, one of the many Scottish names in our area. Um, working with us. So what kind of thing did we pick up? Well, first of all, I learned from the SRP documents that, and uh, by meeting volunteers, that most people were going to be either over 55 or under 21. So there we are. Um, just checking time here. And that to make the group work, there were no, a number of things we had to do. One is work from the interests of people in the group. Right? People who are interested in cemeteries. But as Billy Joe intuitively knew, someone has to direct the interests of the group for it to go anywhere. Um, I think one of the most important ones that comes for me out of the SRP work is consistently train the whole team. And that includes anybody who's functioning as a leader. That you have to always be improving your skills, you always have to be reviewing them and building them up. Um, so, 
What does this look like in the field for us? This is, by the way, um, a very easy site, right? fenced and so forth, contains um, the uh, burials of the relatives of a very uh, known literary figure for our area, T.S. Stribling. You can see some of our field equipment scattered around. This is an early map from the uh, Lauderdale County Cemetery Authority. Uh, you can see it's very simple, but it's showing some of the things that we began to record. First of all, a registered benchmark, GPS located, right, geolocated benchmark, a clear perimeter of what was studied, right, with marks that are recoverable on the edges, and the location of each headstone. In this case, there were not um, unmarked graves in this one. And again, azimuth, so that you can begin to use that as a key to a uh, period of burial, burial and relationship with burial. Um, this one, if we had a little more time, we'd play a guessing game and throw us for a loop. We were, we were doing reconnaissance around the edge, and here was a grave depression. We weren't sure why someone was buried out at the side, and Billy Joe, who was still able to get around at that time, said he'd look into it. This was in his part of the county. Um, Picture a remote part of the Highlands where your cell phone doesn't work. That's, that's where we are here. Uh, and he finally found out that was a dog. It was a dog to, who belonged to one of the people buried in here. And when he was making his will, he said, well, I want the dog buried with me. And they said, well, no, we can't do that. You can bury him close, but you can't bury him in with the rest of us. So one of these funny things that you find as you're working along. But on a serious level, um, the LCCRA works through all of those, uh, through a series of steps in our survey. So first of all is identification of all um, unmarked graves or all graves, including unmarked graves. Um, here's a typical environment that we work in. Um, this may explain to you why we're not using drones, for example, uh, or trying to use uh, GPS, high resolution GPS. There are other reasons uh, not. Um, the tree cover is simply a great challenge to us. Um, so identify all graves. Um, let's see, move ahead here. Again, more examples of our typical uh, environment. Then um, add the spatial. As you've been seeing, my part in the group is very much the mapping part, the spatial representation. So geolocation, as I mentioned, and then a plane table map recording all identifiable burials with the azimuth. Now, in a usual project, we also include comprehensive photography. So in this case, every visible monument, legible or not, would be photographed. Um, and an inventory of burials that can be compared with past records. So present day inventory of what's there. All right, we have just a moment to talk about a day in the field. Again, this is um, a cemetery with many unmarked graves. If you can pick out those white stakes, those are all identified graves that need to be mapped in this environment. Um, this is the kind of map that can come out of that. This was another learning experience map. Um, previous information, it said six to eight marked graves and a scattering of unmarked graves. If you can read the numbers, they go up to 93. Um, and that's been our experience now, is that we double or treble the number of actual burials by careful investigation. So this, if you want to use that horrible jargon, is our value added, this kind of output very precise, stark, but at the same time highly informational cartographic output is an important part of what we do. Now, you also find wonderful things. This is a gravestone from the Allen Cemetery. Um, as you can see, it's, it's beautiful, it's naively produced. It's one of the finer naive or uh, vernacular stones seen in our county. Um, and as I learned last Wednesday, um, we could pick this stone up, put it in the graveyard, workers' graveyard at New Lanark, and no one would know the difference. We could take one from New Lanark and plop it in this cemetery, and no one would ever realize there was a difference. 
So there's some very fascinating kind of bleed over. Here is another uh, naive monument in Old Baptist Cemetery, um, poignant as many of them are, a nine-year-old girl. But here, again, a piece of limestone, hand scratched with the basics of information. This is another site we worked on, Coger Cemetery. You can see the group in action, plane table, ranging rod, other things that many of you recognize. This cemetery was a challenge because of its poor state. You can see the tumbled monuments, the breakdown of many things, even this relatively whole monument vandalized, the tumble of these rocks. But in the end, it was another learning experience because this was where my uh, archaeological exposure in Scotland helped us out. You can see this is a very different drawing. First of all, it's at very large scale. It's, uh, I'm sorry for the non-metric measurements, but it's one inch is five feet. It's a very, very large scale. <laughs> one to 60, by the way, uh, reference fraction. Um, recapture of the original wall. Much of this is tumbled, fenced space, and then shading right, to indicate the degree of the tumble and then a detail of the wall section itself so you could understand why it tumbled. As you can see, right, it's a face wall without rubble in the middle stabilized by a cap. And so when the caps were removed because they were nice and flat and they made good fireplace hearths and other things, the wall began to collapse. So. The realities are that we're limited by age, right? Health and safety things. Many of our volunteers are in the upper 70s now. Um, replication of the group is a challenge. Students are ephemeral. They come and go in their age group, um, get some experience and go on. Uh, we also function on the reality that we get no money. That was part of what the county agreed to. You can be an organization, but you can't have any money. Um, but I want to end with this. Um, this is a remarkable woman, Catherine Wilson, who, uh, as part of a field class I taught in Memphis, Tennessee, agreed to let us use the cemetery of her church as our field site. And that led this last summer to a program where uh, Ansley Kiros, one of my colleagues, and I took 11 students um, to this church to work on oral history that was Ansley's side, and on my side, physical documentation of the cemetery. We were accepted as members of these people's family. I just got an email um, from Catherine this morning encouraging me on this presentation. And here you can see that um, volunteers came from the church, began to learn these skills. I know you're not allowed to do this in Scotland, uh, <laughs> but one of our diagnostic tools for unmarked graves is the ground probe. Um, very, very useful tool. And what's impressive here is that these people know in this parish or this church know who is in many of these unmarked graves. But they're still unmarked. But retrieving exact positions is a challenge. So they were very excited to learn some skills to do that. And in fact, here you can see the grave was identified and the previously buried stone identifying the person in the grave was recovered using the probing process. We also did some other things, some tricks for reading uh, inscriptions here with pressed foil, which is um, more acceptable in the US right now than crayoning um, or using anything on the face itself. And while this is crumbled, you can see that well handled, it can give you quite a result. Again, vernacular markers from that cemetery. And then, of course, a stone circle outside of Killeen. Um, because that's what you see. You see that we had a need in our community. I came to Scotland to learn more about it, brought those ideas back. Those ideas are now circulating in a larger level because of the LCCRA work, because of New Bethel. Um, and the, New the culture of the people at New Bethel Church is formed by a remarkable woman, Frances Wright, from Scotland, who came to that area in the 1820s, purchased land. She, was, she knew Robert Owen and his New Harmony phase. She knew Adam Smith. And 
bought a plantation to purchase blacks, I know, offensive as we would think today, for the purpose of teaching them literacy, making them independent, and letting them free. The area where that church was is where people that she had contact with lived. Now, remarkably, again, when she died, or when she, had, when she went bankrupt, I'm sorry, in that plantation, she could have simply dispersed her slaves, recouped her losses. Instead, she paid for the 30 slaves she owned to be taken to Haiti, where they could never be enslaved. So, right, it's a great circle of experience, of thought, and of exchange of knowledge. Thank you very much.